So I want to follow up in this um, discussion today with uh, a point was made in uh, episode two, I guess we can call them episode two, talk number two, uh, having to do with composition. Uh, someone had said to me on on uh, on uh, a Facebook uh, thing that, um, and I they were basically quoting Gamel, um, and I'm going to read you the quote, but uh, but they're basically quoting Gamel. But I have a second quote from Gamel. Now the reason I mentioned it is because that quote has has Gamel saying that basically if it's a good value spotting, it's a good composition. But I have them actually in the shop talk, and this is now 14, 12, 13 years <laughs> earlier. I have them in the shop talk saying something very different from that and agreeing with Degas on a, uh, that it's something else. And I want to just share that part with you because I think it's really, really important. And sometime we can develop that, but if somebody else puts it out there uh, for us to develop further, I'll be glad to do it. Uh, but anyway, if you will look at uh, number two, uh, at, at your leisure if you're inclined to. And I think we may even follow up a little bit uh, in the color values question in number three. So, but let me just read you the first one and um, uh, where Gamble actually makes this point. Composition reduced to its uh, simplest terms is the agreeable and effective distribution of light and dark masses over a given area. The art of designing consists of endowing these masses with interesting and expressive silhouettes and patterns, which further enhances the effectiveness of their distribution. Now you'll see, now that's, a, that's from a Gamel essay in 1974, and you will see in that, that Gamel has completely eliminated color as a factor in composition. Uh, now, I'm gonna just offset that, and I'm going to use Gamel's own words, but I'm gonna offset that against what Degas says. And, uh, and he says, a picture is a combination of lines and colors that set each other off. To which Gamel responded, and this is in the, tw the shop talk of Edgar Degas. I want to tell you it's page 27. I don't have that written here. But this definition, while by no means exhaustive, remains perhaps the one that best sets forth the fundamental characteristic of a picture having claims to being a work of art. So there's Gamble in conflict with himself, follow? Now, I'm going to give you that second one as coming from 1961, and the essay that I mentioned earlier later is from 1974. I don't know what changes. Gamble didn't simply say to us anything else except that he emphasized values as being in his mind, more important that you get your skills around the distribution of, of uh, the darks and lights and the play they make and the patterning and all those things related. Well, of course, the reason for that is that everything is made out of silhouettes. Even Degas said it's all silhouettes. And yet earlier on, and I, and I, I find nothing in my own experience to the contrary, earlier on, Gamel says that he agrees with Degas, that a picture is a combination of lines and colors that set each other off. Well, how could it not be colors unless we're painting black and white pictures? It has to be colors, and colors are always a factor. And you could say it's not the decisive factor, and I think the reason probably that Gamel actually moved in that direction was that he was, he was there to bring out the academic, to actually reemphasize everything that had been taught in the academies. He wanted to recreate, and he's done a pretty good job, by the way, because I'm having these discussions today that are, you, you know, that are just like fighting old fights that are that are lost causes. Actually, color is a factor in design; always will be. It was even a factor for people like Bouguereau. <laughs> I wouldn't say tell you he was the most exciting colorist, but none of these guys they they did color studies. They figured out a color scheme for their pictures. Uh, the Leightons, the academics. So there's nothing about that, and that makes it a a a. Um, you know, uh, a non-factor. They're part and parcel of a picture. And as I said before to you all, that the, um, uh, at one point or another, you'll find uh, in the ancients that uh, this art is, a, is the art of color. It's an art based on color. Well, what else is it? Of course it is, unless it's based on black and white. Every mark we make is a color value, which is what Hale talks about. So Hale, in the book on Vermeer, actually says that you have to have all these components happening simultaneously. Now that's the most advanced thinking going on in that day. 
even so much, you know, so that a person like Sargent, who was really well educated in the effects-based painting, but it was, but it was, uh, what's that word? Tonal. It wasn't a color-based. The way he was raised wasn't color-based, but he was still making effects, beautiful effects of light, and doing it on the basis of edge relationships, much like a Velasquez would do. But what does he do? When he sees Monet, he goes and sorts out how to reincorporate, how to fully incorporate color from the beginning. And his watercolors are stunning examples of that. Try to imagine those watercolors without color. You know, try to imagine them as just black and whites. I mean, where would the magic be? Of course there'd be some magic there. But those things are tours de force, and they are, their success is significantly in their color. So um, I say that like I'm speaking sort of defensively. I actually am amused by the conversations, but I actually want the succeeding generations of students not to be limited, to be hampered by the limitations of the, pre, of the pre-impressionist era, which had as its kind of its motto, well-drawn is well enough colored. I mean, like, what is that, you know? Why would you want to live there when you could actually live in a world that's now got it all, you know, where now color is a factor? And especially after you've seen the uh, color uh, designing of Degas, the likes of which I don't know if it's ever been quite seen before, especially on the level of the numbers of times that he does remarkable compositions in color. Um, and I'm talking primarily about the pastels in uh, of the dancers. Those things are most, some of the most amazing things, and their color is a huge factor as he becomes more and more blind, you know, in the drawing. I mean, he's always a draftsman, even when his eyes are failing, I mean, he's still a terrific draftsman. I'd call him one of the, maybe the greatest draftsmen of all time. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to, to consider that as an argument um, with, you know, as a debate point. But uh, just I thought that might be useful to you. So that's, that's uh, uh, just the follow-up. So is it just the values? So I'm going to follow up uh, uh, with just one more add-on. The basic thing here is just this whole discussion of whether color is a factor in composition or it's all just values. But last week we had a discussion about style, and that would have been uh, number five, I want to tell you. Uh, and someone asked about style, and they, the question was rather in the direction of, do, are there any styles that I would uh, really dismiss? Uh, and I don't have, as I said I did, at that time, I, said I didn't have an objection to style per se, but I believe a student's primary job is not the art school problem. The primary job is the nature problem. And I'm only going to give you this one quote to add on to your thinking as you go on uh, uh, pursuing the question of style. Uh, and I said before that, for example, style, you can follow a Rubin style, you can follow uh, Frazetta today or... Kincaid or somebody, and everybody, all these people have their sort of style. What makes it style is that it's de- it deviates from nature in significant ways. El Greco, with his ext- you know, elongated figure. So if you understand by that, I mean style, follow here what um, da Vinci says. And I'm going to leave you with this quote. I'll try not to make too many comments afterwards. So uh, da Vinci says, the painter will produce pictures of little merit if he takes the works of others as his standard. That's where style comes from. Unless you take it, as I say, from the fingerprint, from your own fingerprint. But, he says, if he will apply himself to learn from the objects of nature, he will produce good results. So that was my encouragement to the student. Study nature, study nature. Don't worry about style. Your fingerprints are your style. The way you make things, the things that inspire you are going to make it yours and yours alone. You're a snowflake, so to speak. <laughs> These days that means other things. But you're, you're in that category of you're a person that's different from every other person. And let your natural differences come out. I mean, don't start becoming puny versions of a sergeant or somebody else whose style you're imitating. So that was my cause. I just thought it'd be useful to hear Da Vinci says, study nature, and whatever that, whatever that takes you to is where you want to be is where you want to go, and not, not uh, following other people's stuff. Everybody's always turning their heads. I have a student who's always doing that. He's always showing me a picture by somebody else that's inferior to him. And he's showing me what this guy's doing now, what that guy's doing now, what some other guy's doing now. And I'm saying, man, stay the course. You're, you're, you're you, man. Don't try to be somebody else. Okay, thank you very much. I'm out of here. <laughs>